Welcome back. Hi, everybody. My name is Katherine Hubert. I'm the owner here at Chez Jeunesse, a very small French-inspired cafe in the heart of downtown Greensboro, North Carolina. It is our goal to change the way that our world both views and employs adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. This is our YouTube channel where we talk about who we are, why we do it, how we do it. And today, we are going to be talking about terms to avoid when talking about disability or when talking about people with disabilities. We're gonna dive in. We're gonna talk first about euphemisms. So fun. Um, but we're talking about that because there actually are a lot of euphemisms around disabilities. And it is helpful, I think, to take a step back. When do we normally use euphemisms? Why do we typically use them? I think that'll be informative as to why we should not use them around disabilities. So, think in your own brain hole for just a second about euphemisms that you use or that you commonly hear other people use. Um, a lot of times, I asked a group this, we did a workshop several weeks ago, and I was like, name off some euphemisms, and they all were like, what? <laughs> it's like, come on. <laughs> it's like, usually they're around sex, or bodily functions or fluids. That's typically where we like exercise our, our euphemistic terms the most. Um, so they're used a lot around periods and menstrual cycles, right? So it's like, it's her time of the month, ant flow. Neither one of those things is descriptive directly of what a period actually is. Why do we use euphemisms around periods? Because we're uncomfortable talking about them and it's somehow for a long time been pretty taboo culturally. So you come up with other descriptors. Um, the same thing around other bodily functions, especially in the South, love to use a lot of different words for having to pee or poop. Um, and then sex is another one where there's a lot of euphemisms around. And that one is probably the thing that people think of first when they think of a euphemism. It has a sexual connotation because that's the category that we use them in the most. It's not specific to that. Um, doing it, knocking boots, sleeping together. Those are all euphemisms for actually having sexual intercourse. We don't like to say that outright or haven't because culturally it hasn't been accepted or you try to find a lighter, more digestible, palatable, kid-friendly version. Um, but all of those things, the reason <laughs> I'm going into that before we talk about euphemisms around disability culture is because the underlying message there is we should not be talking about this. So therefore, instead of calling something exactly what it is because there's silence or shame or secrecy or privacy, it's an untouchable in some way subject, we come up with other softer, gentler, less obvious ways to talk about something. That can be harmful. It is, I would argue, harmful in the areas of sex and sexuality, bodily functions, and periods. It's not helpful. Um, talking around something versus just talking about something. Somehow, when talking about disabilities, though, we feel like it's nicer to use a term other than disability or disabled. The fact that we think we need to come up with a nicer way to say that implies that we think there's something wrong with that term in the first place. That is a problem. So, part of destigmatizing disability is by calling it what it is. And by doing that in a neutral, observational, factual way. So there's nothing inherently good or bad about disability. It's a term. We should use it. 
and we're going to talk about some terms that often are used to replace disability or disabled and why. Hopefully, at this point, you're already having an understanding of why you should not use them. So, I'm going to write some of these down, flip them around to the screen. Most of these are probably terms that you have heard of. Differently abled. Don't say that. Um, Handy capable. Also, don't say that. Challenged. Don't say that either. Special needs or special ed. Also, don't say that. This one is something that has been, like, some of these are kind of kitschy terms that have been thrown around recently. Special needs is something that has been super prominent and prevalent in culture and society, especially in the past probably like 15, 10, 15 years. Um, maybe a little bit longer, but definitely the last 10, 15 years. Um, and th this is like, no, this is the socially acceptable and the nice way to say disability is you say special needs don't you're gonna have to rewrite your brain a little bit on this one but don't say that one um, and then those are so those are terms just say disabled or person with a disability depending on if you're using identity first or person first language we do have a video we're gonna link over here <laughs> to that so that you can watch that because that's another um, some other helpful tips about how to use person first versus identity first. So a disabled person versus a person with a disability. A disabled person would be identity first. Person with a disability would be person first. There's pros and cons to both. People with disabilities prefer both. Like different people prefer different things. Surprising. Um, so watch that video if you want more in-depth information about those two things. But um, you don't use these when talking about a disability or a disabled person. Then when talking about a disability, someone having a disability, avoid terms, I'm not going to write these down, avoid terms like afflicted by, suffers from, a victim of, that also all implies that it's negative or wrong or bad to have a disability um, we want to take away that connotation that doesn't belong there the the shame and the the idea that having a disability is wrong or an ailment is not true um, and it's become a belief system by some people in the world so we're trying to break against that no afflicted by suffers from victim of simply state disability or disabled or the specific disability autism down syndrome fragile x cerebral palsy etc um, and then lastly avoiding the use of normal regular typical We've talked about this a little bit in previous videos that the idea of something being normal is a totally misused and understood social construct anyways. Um, I don't think there is such a thing as normal. Every single human is different and that's a beautiful and a good thing. But a lot of times when referring to a disabled person versus a non-disabled person, we use the term normal or typical standard hopefully you can see why all of that is not okay you don't want to be like this this is the standard for being a human or for living and you don't meet that um, again false not true so we don't want to compare and contrast using those terms instead simply disabled non-disabled 
person with a disability, person without a disability, totally sufficient and fine. Um, so, avoid euphemisms when talking about disabilities. Don't imply that there's something wrong with having a disability when saying someone has one. And then lastly, don't assume or project the idea that someone without a disability is the norm or the social standard. Feels somewhat basic and common sense. However, it's not the way that we've been taught and trained. So it is gonna take probably a minute for you to get comfortable with that. It still takes me some, it's taking me some time to get comfortable with it too. But by practicing, like language and words hold so much power. And I know that that's not like a, that's not an original brain thought that I just put out there into the world, but it's a true one. And the things that we speak over other people and over ourselves hold a lot of weight and hold a lot of power, probably more than we actually know. And the more that you practice the words and the language that you use and the meaning and implications behind them, the more comfortable you will get and the more it frees other people up to do the same thing. So it has taken me, we, I grew up using, um, grew up, I would say, as an adult, practice using person first language so saying a person with autism or a person with a disability we hire people with intellectual and developmentally or de developmental disabilities um, and then when I started learning more about identity first language and actually switching some of that up and that some humans with disabilities prefer identity first language and I started saying things like an autistic person, a disabled person, hiring intellectually and developmentally disabled adults, like switching some of that terminology around, it kind of would like catch me off guard. That's because all the stupid stigmas and the narratives that I have consciously or subconsciously absorbed over the years and thinking somehow in saying that, that I was saying something that was negative. So backing up and being like, it's not negative. I don't believe that it is with my brain and my intellect or with my heart, but somewhere still in my body, I'm having this response of like, wait a second, you're not supposed to do that. So retraining myself um, and just, again, speaking things in a neutral, factual, observational way, which is a great way to reduce shame in other areas of life as well. That has been helpful for me in a lot of ways. Um, but the more that I've freed myself up to do that, the more I've noticed that my staff is more and more comfortable talking about their disabilities, about disability in general, and just using terms for what they are. So it has a ripple effect. I would encourage you with that. We're re redoing some language over here. Hopefully this is helpful. If you have questions about that, please don't hesitate to ask us, whether that's in the comment section below or you reach out to us on our Instagram or our website. Um, it's something that we love to get involved in. If we don't know the answer, we, we typically throw questions out to our whole team. And that's the benefit, one of the benefits of having an integrated staff is that I get to talk to my teammates with disabilities and say, what do you think about this? And what do you prefer? And how does this make you feel when you hear someone say this? And then actually getting to have those conversations and we get to have those conversations because we built trust and we do life together. And that's been hugely pivotal and life-changing for me and in my own perspective to get to hear firsthand from people that the language or the decisions are, are directly impacting and hear how it is impacting or affecting them. Um, so, I could talk about this for days. Anyways, I'm done. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate you. We'll see you next week.